In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, Intel's Optane, Main Gear's Groovy Vibe, an alien gaming laptop from another world, and Intel 9th Gen, and AMD Zen 2, and Apple's Sinister Plan, and more next. Well, now, welcome back to another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. We've taken a uh, a small respite from the show for a couple of weeks while we while we worked uh, tirelessly, entirely too much. Marco Cipetta is with me again, and and the illustrious uh, Chris Getting as well. Fellas, how's it going today? Going good, man. No complaints. Beautiful day here in Connecticut. Got the dog sleeping in the other room. Got a little bit of work done today, so. Uh... Kind of positive. <laughs> positive. You know what they say. Let sleeping dogs lie, Marco. Let them lie. Oh, well, I have two kids, so the dog never gets to lie. <laughs> <laughs> lying dogs. Chris, do you have any lying dogs up there? In uh, the some, somewhere in around here, I'm sure. She's always laying mm -hmm. somewhere. But, uh, yeah, end of a long day, relaxing finally. And you get uh, some now I'm here. You got some vintage T-shirt going on there, brother. Oh, black screen. Well, I like that. Yeah, as I, I, like as I said, my nephew was requesting more Mario on the show, so here we go. Excellent for for a nephew who? What's his name? Let's let's give him a shout Gavin. out. Yep. Yeah, Gavin. There's your little dose of Super Mario, brother. You need to tune in to us now, Gavin. Be a good boy. <laughs> hey, uh, Chris. Let's let's talk about what we're imbibing today on the show. I'm I'm having something very very unique this is a six point dabble and this is a double ipa and uh from six point brew is one of my favorites by the way we get we need a beer sponsorship chris and i were talking about this mm -hmm. uh yeah six point dabble and this is a super hazy juicy all kinds of crazy hops there's like a pineapple hop in there or something like that they're saying and look at that thing it's like man it's it's a meal it's a meal in a glass i tell you what do you got that yeah, I love double IPAs. I'm I've got the Long Trail Brewing uh, Green Blaze IPA from uh, Vermont, and uh, oh. I am not quite sure how I feel about it yet. I really like their their regular IPA from Green Trail Brewing. Um, this one's got a note of something at the front end I haven't quite placed yet. That's a little a little sharp, but the more I drink it, the more I like it. So I guess that's not a problem. Got it. Got it. Marco, what kind of notes are you are you uh, imbibing? Are they sharp or flat, Marco? Um, I have a, a nutty mixture of uh, H and O. <laughs> and uh, as, I, as I sip it, it quenches my thirst with some cooling action. Excellent, Smithers. Excellent. Wow. That was uh, – did you, did you decant that H2O before you began imbibing it? <laughs> No, it's really cool. So here, here in Connecticut, we have these things um, in our kitchens. They're called faucets, and you, you turn the faucet, oh, and cold wow. water comes out. And I caught it in the glass, and I was good to go. Chris in Maine doesn't have that <laughs> fancy. Never heard called of faucets. Yeah, <laughs> never heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to they have to go to the to the well and the bucket and the you know the rope. Yeah, that's what they do in Maine. <laughs> All right, fellas, enough with the goofy. All right, let's get serious there, Dag Nabbit. We have a lot of tech to talk about. Actually, tons of stuff to talk about um, because it's been a while and we're, we're accumulating um, all kinds of bits and bites. Are you, are you, were you about to harass me, Chris? Well, you, were, uh, you were laughing. No, I was just going to ask if, if YouTube is down because I cannot get to it right now. Oh, It could just I be me way up here in the woods. No, yeah. I, just, no I, I, I just refreshed and we're all good, I think. Okay, I, just me. I, I, I see you and your fabulous Super Mario T-shirt just fine. Yep, yep, we're good. So hey, uh, let's let's dive into the headlines. We've got a ton of them. Uh, lots of stuff going on. Lots of reviews. Lots of news. Um, you know, the the PC enthusiast PC space is still firing. The the mobile space is is bubbling as well. It seems like we don't catch a, a breath lately. Um, yeah, like lull is not enough vernacular. Um, but uh, Marco's been losing sleep at an alarming rate and uh, doing all kinds of great reviews. He took a look at Intel's Optane Memory H10 hybrid SSD storage acceleration. Uh, yeah, what's hybrid about it, buddy? Why don't you tell us? Tell us what we're looking at there. Looking pretty fancy. 
Yeah, so the, the Optane Memory H10 is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a new class of product. So we, in the past, we've looked at uh, Optane Memory. Those are the, the lower capacity 3D cross point based drives that Intel uses with their RST software to cache data from a slower storage volume, okay? That's the quick overview. And then we've also looked at QLC, NAND flash SSDs. So a typical SSD, some of the newer, more affordable drives are based on quad level cell NAND flash memories. Um, what the H10 does is combine an Optane memory uh, stick and a QLC NVMe SSD onto a single uh, M.2 drive. There's actually two controllers, two different sets of media. It's literally two solid state drives on one stick that share a PCI Express X4 electrical connection to the system. So what the H10 does is allow you to have you know, a large QLC, well, relatively large. There's three capacities. Let me just run through the specs quickly. There's one with 16 gigs of Optane memory and 256 gigs of QLC NAND. The next step up is 32 gigs of Optane memory with 512 gigs of QLC. And the top end one is 32 gigs of Optane and one terabyte of QLC storage. So what these drives do is they let you have a higher capacity QLC SSD with that Optane memory acceleration, but in a single slot. So it works just like the previous Optane memory. When Intel's RST software is installed, you, you go in there, you enable Optane memory. It's literally just a single toggle. I have a shot of the control panel in the review. Turns on the Optane memory and the most commonly uh, accessed bits of data on the QLC drive, which acts as the boot volume, get cached onto the Optane memory. Now, if you disable the Optane memory, it looks like two SSDs to the system. Um, there's like 27 gigs of capacity available on the Optane memory. I forget the exact like 474 gigs of QLC NAND available um, with the 512 uh, version that we tested. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting drive. So the drawback to a setup like this is under worst case conditions, you have a QLC SSD with only an X2 connection, with only you know, two PCI Express lanes connecting to the system. But in a best case situation, both the Optane memory and the QLC NAND can kind of work together and you get those low Q depth 4K read benefits of Optane plus the capacity of QLC without having to manage two volumes. It's, it's, it's an interesting product. Hmm. Yeah, so what's the... Where, where do you see this being used the most? So what's the what's the main install base that we might see this in? Where where where's the um, the value proposition? I guess is is the is the mainstream enthusiast going to be interested in this in their in their desktop gaming rig or is this mobile or where are we at? Um, well, this is not going to be sold at retail at least at first. So the H10 is destined to be an OEM product, which means Intel is going to sell it to their partners that will use it in in small form factor systems and ultrabooks. It's really designed for those systems that may have just one M.2 slot, but you want the benefits of 3D cross point and Optane memory and can't sacrifice the capacity. And you also want a solid state storage drive in there. So they're, they're, they're kind of targeting a wide array of systems. Uh, let me just jump to my last page here because I don't want to get the pricing wrong. So Intel hasn't disclosed pricing for the actual drives, um, but we're hearing that the, the entry level H10 will probably arrive in notebooks in the $799 to $950 range, the next one up from $950 to like $1499, and the top end model in $1500 and higher notebooks, you know, more premium notebooks. Now, you might be asking yourself, or some of you might be asking yourself, why the heck would I want this versus just a large SSD? And there's two hmm. reasons. Now, if you look at the, the performance data, I have some traditional synthetic benchmarks in there. You know, I have Crystal Disk Mark, Addo, PC Mark. And what you'll see is the drive actually performs really well in the trace based tests in PC Mark, which is sort of a gauge of how it feels when you're using the system. But in terms of peak transfers, it doesn't even compare with the Intel SSD uh, 760p, right? So the 760p, mm. much better sequential transfers, you know, in the neighborhood of like a gigabyte per second better. And that's not even one of the faster SSDs. But mm. what, this, what this Optane memory does is give you much higher low Q depth 4K reads 
which translates into more responsiveness when you're just using the system. That's kind of one of the more important metrics. Plus, it behaves really consistently under load. So some of the tests I ran, I had a 18 gigabyte video file copying while I was launching applications. And what you see is this drive performance barely changes, whereas a standalone SSD, the load times can be two, three, four, you know, six X longer when you have contention on the single drive. So in terms of the overall user experience, it, it could actually be better, even though under worst case scenario, the drive isn't as fast as some other SSDs. So there's some nuance here, but that's the hook. Nice, nice. You know, I, I was looking at the PC Mark scores, and and what occurs to me with this drive, uh, and with Optane in general, <clears throat> is that I think the average mainstream consumer, okay, not not the heavy duty content creation professional, certainly not the enthusiast gamer or power user like that, um, but the average mainstream consumer that's um, interested in system response times as it relates to things like application loading. Um, even simple, you know, random file access of web surfing. You know, there's a lot of different um, file access, small file access going on when when you're surfing the web. Lots of things getting, you know, JavaScript getting uh, processed and things like that. When when you talk about these shallow, quick hit, you know, multitasked workloads, Optane does really well. And I would think, you know, in the average laptop where the you know the average consumer is looking at that um, type of performance, it's going to feel, uh, you know, faster in, in, in a lot of cases, perhaps than a standard NVMe drive with the caveat of perhaps long sequential transfers, which again, most mainstream consumers, they're not crunching video. Um, I think it's more prevalent, you know, perhaps than it was in, in uh, you know, the past few years where, you know, folks are starting to create more and more, certainly, you know, pictures, editing and, and image editing and stuff like that is very common. But, you know, heavy duty, long sequential you know, transfers and file access, not so much as in, in the mainstream, right? So this thing should feel pretty like, you know, experientially, not, you know, benchmark numbers aside, this thing should feel pretty good, right? <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of where it shines, right? So in in those sequential transfer tests, like I said, it just doesn't it just doesn't hang with some of the faster drives. But if you've ever even if you have an SSD, right? If you've ever let's say had a a BitTorrent coming down, I know some of you may do that from time to time. And maybe a, <laughs> like if you're downloading a game from Steam, right? We've all and you got a fast broadband connection. Steam can just crank data onto your drive. You know, yeah. so let's mm -hmm. say you have Steam downloading a huge game, right? Your antivirus kicks in, another process kicks in. Even with a fast SSD, you'll feel your system slow to a crawl. I mean, it's happened to me in, in my current rig. I'm sure it's happened to lots of you. This won't do that. I mean, it'll do it if you really nail it with a bunch of workloads because there's only so much data it can transfer. But versus a standalone SSD, Optane is, is simply way more consistent and having, you know, those two kind of two concurrent drives there to, to load balance, it makes a difference. And under more situations, the drive remains responsive more often. So that that's kind of where it's at. We and they didn't talk. They didn't talk pricing on a, a specific, you know, per module uh, and density uh, type um, equation, but they did hint to uh system pricing right and i think that was it 7.99 was it that is that where the system pricing starts yeah yeah so yeah. that's kind of it's not budget it's maybe upper mid range you know and then you're going to see this in premium machines is that is that where you, where you think it'll it'll lie i think the higher capacity ones too you know and, and actually that's another point that we should make you know lots of lots of notebooks nowadays you buy it and you don't know where the SSD is sourced unless you specifically can configure it. With this, yeah. if you pick it as an option, I mean, first of all, Intel's marketing dollars, it's gonna be called out specifically. So you'll know when a notebook comes with this. But if it's an mm -hmm. option to purchase, it's nice to know exactly what you're getting. You know, that's that's yeah. another thing to consider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Is uh, interesting to yeah, you or? I what? think it makes for a fantastic option for your boot drive because of all the responsiveness um, advantages you talked about. 
um, you know, even just loading your your daily files and documents on there, quick and responsive. And then if you are doing massive file transfers, video editing, et cetera, putting in a second dedicated NVMe drive that can really handle those workloads and get the best of both worlds. But I think for most people, again, you're in those small, quick file transfers and the Optane's just gonna blow it away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool stuff, <clears throat> cool stuff. Do you think, Marco, this thing will get into the channel and uh, be sold uh, separately as a, a standalone, uh, at least, you know, maybe on Amazon or something like that? I'm sure that some of them will trickle out to be available somewhere. Now, you do need, uh, you know, well, first of all, with Optane memory, you need certain chipsets for it to be compatible. You know, seventh, uh, I'm sorry, eighth and ninth gen uh, Intel platform with their, you know, uh, adjacent chipsets. But you mm -hmm. also need certain hooks in the BIOS to handle, you know, the bifurcation of the PCI Express lane. So I don't think they're going to show up right away. And I, it will work on some desktop platforms because I know some others tested on desktops. I tested mm -hmm. it in a, uh, you know, HP notebook that was specifically <laughs> configured for it. But I, I think it's more likely um to remain an oem product and not officially hit retail because you know on, on an enthusiast system you either want a dedicated larger optane drive like the optane ssds not optane memory or you're going to use the standalone optane memory and a, a different ssd so they'll, they'll probably trickle out but i don't think they're ultimately destined for retail gotcha Gotcha. Yeah, cool stuff. Intel Optane Memory H10. Uh, they've got it all on one stick. Marco, do you think uh, one, one of the things that sort of caught my attention with this thing is how it's set up? You've got um, Optane Memory and QLC NAND Flash, uh, two separate controllers over a by four PCI Express link bifurcated into two by twos. So not technically could be could be fuller bandwidth for each memory controller. Do you see perhaps a uh, by eight down the road, maybe of this thing? Uh, you think Intel will pull that off? Is there perhaps a, a business case justification for that or what? I don't think so. I mean, it's not in this form factor. And I don't think if you're gonna do an add-in card, you're gonna want the standalone Optane. So, I mean, they could do whatever they want, but I don't think that's coming. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, spitballing, thinking out loud. Uh, PCI Express adapter card kind of stuff with a hybrid setup. Eh, I don't know. <laughs> um, all on one drive, you know, with with the benefits of both worlds. But, um, anyways, yeah. What do what do I know? What do I know? <clears throat> let's uh, let's move on. That's uh, that's good stuff. Thanks, Marco. Check out the review live at hothardware.com. We've got tons of benchmarks. Marco poured his uh, hard out as usual on this thing so you can see how it performs in lots of different applications the uh, intel optane memory h10 check it out uh so chris um uh, is gonna gonna chat with us a little bit about main gears vibe uh the 2019 version that uh, paul Lilly from uh, hothardware.com checked out there it is at actually pax east in boston i saw it live myself as well impressive little machine for you know, quite frankly, not the boutique price premium that we're used to from guys like Mangare who build some amazing stuff, but often not for, you know, the, the light of wallets. Uh, this is a little bit different. The Mangare vibe. What do you think there, Chris? Yeah, this is a system I am quite excited about um, because I, I'm a bit of a, of a Mangare fan here. But um, beyond that, uh, it's really nice to see a ready to ship product like this that is so well crafted it has you know the the custom touches to it with their nice cable runs and everything um but it ships in two business days so that's a really good sign and of course the the pricing is really kind of just barely above cost when you when you compare it to a diy equivalent um, so that's very promising. And speaking of DIY on this, Main Gears also announced that not only do they have these pre-built Vibe systems, but you can actually just get the Vibe case if you want to build in it. And so you can do all your own custom work in it with the beautiful Vibe chassis. And if you want their liquid cooling option with it too, you can get that as well. So I, I really like the moves they're making there, especially to bring in more of the mainstream market um, just as a, as a company decision, not just leaving it up to the people with a lot of money to flash for a gorgeous piece of art 
PC, um, really making it accessible for more gamers. So what we looked at um, was one of their higher end systems. Um, so this is what they're calling the stage four system. They have different uh, base set configurations. There's not a lot of customizability to them. You can get the stage one through stage, I think stage four is the highest. Um, and so this one comes with a Core i9-9900K with the GeForce RTX 2080 and 16 gigs of uh, DDR4 HyperX memory clocked at uh, 3466, mm -hmm. which is really fast. Um, and then you get a half terabyte NVMe SSD and two terabytes of storage and on and on. Like it's a, it's a very well spec machine for 2500. Um, so yeah. uh, if we if we if we go down and just look at the interior of it, I mean, you wouldn't think that this is a quote unquote pre built system with with the way they have everything laid out, run the the liquid cooling looks great even with the, the all-in-one they have in the photo there. Um, there is, of course, the rainbow LED RGB lighting, but uh, you can tame that to whatever colors you want. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you need a remote to control the lighting. Um, there's, there's not a software configuration option. Um, it, it depends. Uh, alien, uh, excuse me. Um, Mangear has both. Um, okay. They actually have, yeah. It, this machine, I, mm, I don't know if they have the remote in this machine. I'd have to, I'd have to look into it. Um, but they do have the machine, uh, the remote on uh, some of their higher end machines. <clears throat> right. And so you know, even going down and looking at the the backside of the motherboard, where a lot of manufacturers will just cram cables and leave a rat's nest, it's pretty well run. It's not the most immaculate system um that you're gonna find on the market but you know and when you get into the higher custom diy systems they'll be cleaner than this but for a for a ready to go pre-built system it's uh very impressive and of yeah. course we we need to jump into the the performance side of things because it can be as pretty as you want but if it doesn't perform what's the point and we found that it performs really well. So it's a very similar configuration to the Aurora R8 that I took a look at, which just differs in the Aurora has a 9700K and 32 gigs of RAM at- um, The Aurora 20, from Alienware, right? <laughs> right, yeah. the, the Alienware Aurora. Um, and so, you know, you get more processing power with the main gear, a little more memory with the Alienware, which, you know, is, is or is not relevant depending on how much you're multitasking with it. Um, more RAM's not going to help you if you're not using it. And so, you know, what we're seeing with the the couple of benchmarks that we have side by side, the the main gear is outperforming it, and it's also about five hundred dollars cheaper. So yeah. you're getting a really good value there, at least relative to the Alienware system, um, with a very high level of polish on it. So, yeah, I like what I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and so just just you know backing up a step here on this machine, um, it actually starts with a Ryzen five configuration um, at six ninety nine, um, and that's you know fully configured from main gear, um, you know um, all in one liquid cooler, the whole the whole nine yards, um, lighting, all that good stuff. Starts at six ninety nine for a base level. Um, Ryzen 5 configuration. I'm not sure what the GPU is in that configuration as well. But <clears throat> let's take a step back and talk a little bit about, about Main Gear and the, and the people behind the company because they're impressive. And, and this isn't a sponsored plug. Um, this is me talking, you know, right from the heart. Uh, I've known the CEO of, of Main Gear for many years and actually Ron Reed as well, the marketing manager there. Marco has met uh, met these guys as well, knows, knows uh, Wallace Santos, the CEO, really well as well. Um, we go way back with these guys since our beginning, actually, and they've, they're, they're local to us, Northeast. They're in New Jersey, Kenilworth, New Jersey. This is <clears throat> a move by the CEO to sort of break out from the boutique you know, super high end, as you mentioned, Chris, work of art kind of PC that they've they're known for, to appeal to a much more mainstream audience. You know, one of the things that folks always 
you know, sort of, you know, chirp on is, you know, man, you, you guys build some beautiful stuff, but I can't afford it. I mean, you know, let's face it, you know, the average consumer isn't going to afford a $5,000 gaming PC. And that's, that's what these guys are known for building. Right. So this is really a, 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 a move away from that to bring some of that, you know, sort of white glove service, the attention to detail, the build quality, all that good stuff that they're known for to a much more affordable price point. And then, oh, by the way, if you want, go down to Micro Center, and I think you can you can pick it up online at Micro Center too. You can build it yourself. If you're a DIY kind of person, you want to build a, a main gear config with their custom case. And this is a full custom case, the vibe that they did. Um, as well as uh, you know all their different specifications, you, there's a shopping list, and we may even head down to New Jersey and actually do that with Wallace, build a a, a vibe, if you will. <clears throat> but it's it's really um it, it's it's an impressive effort, and I hope they do well with it. I think they're you know sort of breaking into a, a an area of the market that's certainly a lot more competitive, but they've mm -hmm. established sort of a a good following behind their brand for this high end stuff. And now they're going to bring some some of that to the mainstream and see how it works. So, I applaud them for for making that um, that effort uh, right. to to bring the pricing down. Yeah, my only hope is that they can keep up on the the support side as well as they have been with what I presume will be an influx of customers here, um, because if they can really tailor to these pre pre built customers as well as they do their custom config customers, they're going to gain just a ton of fans. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's the thing. It's all about scale. When you start to get to these lower price points, you, you know, volume tends to be higher. And how, how can you support that? I would I would tell you when you talk to these guys, you know, anybody there and Marco, we've been we've been to the shop and we've seen them building PCs, the places. I mean, you can eat off the floor. It's immaculate. Um, and yeah, they they have this sort of mentality of, you know, here's what I want in this kind of product that game is themselves. And here's how I would want to be treated. So I hope they can scale that. And that's that's going to be the the trick mm -hmm. is can they scale it? Marco, what, what are your thoughts on this on this machine? You know, I think it's awesome. So, you know, one of the things that allows the boutique builders to sort of command a premium is that attention to detail, that immaculate build quality, which, you know, Main Gear is one of the boutique builders that is absolutely known for that. The interiors of their systems are awesome. But that puts them out of reach to lots of people. The vibe, you know, you get beautiful off the shelf hardware inside this nice custom case. So you still have, you know, something you're not going to get at another OEM. But with that nice build quality, with a very minimal markup, it's just win, win, win. Yeah. 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 I, we'll have to see it. You know, <clears throat> I actually got, you know, an invite from Wallace, by the way, buddy. So maybe I'll be trekking down to uh to your neck of the woods uh where where he did invite us to come you know go go down with him to micro center pick up some parts and and build a vibe together and and uh, so maybe we'll we'll bring that to an episode here one of these days um because it's a cool place to see these guys run it like they run it like a, a car shop like a hot rod car shop it's all you know mm -hmm. Set up. We have we out. have a tour on the channel somewhere. It was a few years ago, but there's a video in our on our YouTube channel that tours the shop, yeah. at least the way the shop was years ago. Yeah, they've Time expanded for a refresh. A yeah, <laughs> so it's good stuff. It's good stuff for sure. Uh, anything else, Chris? Notable on this thing, uh, other than uh, the you know, performance per dollar? Um, I, yeah, I mean, obviously the performance per dollar is very good compared to other pre-builds we've looked at. Um, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a really good looking first step for them into a broader market. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I was looking at the the acoustics on it. Paul's looks like he's got a, a decibel meter held up to the thing, running some uh, stress tests, and it's pushing forty one dB. So pretty quiet too. Pretty stealthy. Yeah. Good stuff. The main gear vibe for 2019. Check it out at hothardware.com. We've got a full review. It's for a pre built, it's as uh, inexpensive as probably you can find for the component selection uh, these days. And uh, but but not your average pre built because it's built by the guys at, at main gear who really know how to really know how to put together a, a, a well well uh, equipped machine with uh, immaculate cable routing like Marco does with the origami, right? Right, Marco? 
<laughs> I haven't done one in a long time. I'm losing my skills. I really need to build myself a rig. Holy cow. Oh, my goodness. Don't lose your chops. Don't lose your cabling chops, dude. <clears throat> That's important stuff for a bona fide geek like yourself. <laughs> So, uh, all right, well, let's let's move on. Let's move on to uh, something slightly mobile. Uh, I'm not sure you'd actually call it completely mobile. It's it's a laptop, um, but it's a beast of a laptop. And that's Alienware's Area 51M. We have a full review with copious benchmarks, a full teardown if you haven't seen it. And uh, yeah, there it is, the Alienware Area 51. This is a 17-inch machine, specifically a 17.3-inch uh, full HD display. As you can see, nice thin bezels on that display as well. But it's uh, only 1080p with a 144 hertz refresh rate panel. So it's also G-Sync capable. Um, so they went after the, the super high refresh gamer set with this thing. But this machine is actually very different in a number of ways. First, it uses desktop components. I'm not saying desktop class, like literally desktop components. So Core i9-9900K processor, that's an eight core desktop chip. Uh, our machine came configured with a GeForce RTX 2080 GPU. Again, full desktop specifications, although it was built onto a custom Dell Alienware GPU module. Um, had 32 gigs of DDR4 2400 memory, uh, RAID uh, 0 dual 512 gig NVMe solid state drive setup for one terabyte plus a one terabyte hard drive uh, with hybrid SSD on board. <clears throat> um, just decked out, uh, killer you know, wireless networking, NIC, the whole nine yards. Um, this machine is really set up like a desktop, okay? So desktop CPU, desktop GPU, um, copious amounts of RAM, RAID arrays, it's just crazy, right? The, the entire machine is also user serviceable and upgradable. So I don't know, John, if you can pull up uh, the, the guts of this machine. I think I've got a, a screenshot there somewhere. But this machine is so modularized, the CPU is socketable, the GPU is modular, and you know you can you can easily get at that as well and and pop that out. Of course, the RAM and the you know the the NIC and the drives they're all available as well. And Alienware even <clears throat> went so far as to map out each of the locations. There it is, right there, uh, of of where each of the components are on this bottom shroud that's underneath the bottom cover. Once you get into the the bottom side of the machine. And so really they they mapped it out and, and documented how to get at it and where everything was located. Really just set this thing up so that that you know enthusiasts and users could, if they would like, upgrade the machine themselves, you know, make this thing accessible to the end user later on in life, you know, when you wanna perhaps change something out and upgrade it. Uh, CPUs. You know, it's a it's a standard socketable, um, you know, LGA eleven fifty whatever, um, eleven fifty one, I think. Yeah, um, <clears throat> socket. So, you know, that's all standard issue stuff. If you don't have to go to Dell for it, they suggest it just because they'll pre qualify the the CPU. The GPU, obviously, you would need to uh, go to Dell for that. Um, because it's a, it's a custom module. Um, but you know, you can start at a 2060 if you want and migrate up to a 2070, 2080 later on. Um, that's available sort of, you know, what, what's in, an interesting question to sort of ponder here is how long these platforms are going to be socket compatible, um, in, in the way that Dell has set them up in this machine. So that's, that's a sort of a, a caveat to think about up front. Um, but you have to applaud Dell for the effort here. We've seen desktop CPUs and GPUs in other machines before. Uh, folks like Euricom have done this, but I, I don't think anybody has done it so well as Dell with this with this machine, with this, this Alienware machine. It's It has a, a level of refinement that goes far beyond um, a desktop replacement notebook. The machine itself is eight and a half pounds, which for a desktop replacement notebook with a, an eight core desktop CPU really isn't that heavy. It seems heavy. It certainly is to the average ultra book, but 
yeah, eight to 10 pounds, that's kind of the weight class, right? But this thing, if you compare it to the average gaming um, notebook in the eight to 10 pound weight class, will pretty much spank anything out there. It, it competes with desktops. And it also does it without being loud. Like, well, I shouldn't say that. It, it does it without being louder than the other gaming desktops in its weight class. That's, a, that's the way I should term that. It's, it gets loud, certainly, when the fans spin up and you put it under load. But it's actually fairly tame, relatively speaking, to its other you know, competitive products in the market that have at least a similar class firepower. And, and again, it's, it's faster than most, or if not all. Um, you, you really have to step up to you know, something that's got a desktop class, CPU and GPU in it, and that they're hard to find. So impressive stuff. The design also is really efficient, like well done. Um, you know, I'm gushing a little bit, um, but it's impressive. It, it certainly has its caveats. It's, it is a desktop replacement notebook. You're not gonna just chuck this thing in a backpack. It takes two AC adapters to power it. And oh, by the way, for RTX 2080 laptops, as we've learned, that's commonplace. We've seen systems from MSI and ASUS as well that have dual AC adapters big, you know, five, five pound bricks, two of them. Um, so, you know, there, there's some caveats there, but if you are into uh, desktop replacement notebooks, and obviously you can hook this thing up to a, a, you know, 34 inch panel and treat it like a desktop when you, when you get back to your home office or whatever, um, it's, it's pretty impressive. Marco, you spent some time with this thing. Am I, uh, am I going overboard with my praise for what Dell has assembled? <laughs> no, it's really a beautiful machine. Uh, you know, it's super powerful. It's not a thin and light, but thinner and lighter than most other of the monstrous, you know, non Max Q, you know, full powered uh, NVIDIA GPU powered gaming notebooks. Uh, it's quieter. It's got that nice high refresh rate screen, nice keyboard, adjustable lighting. It's just a, it's a really, it's, premium through and through and it has the performance to back it up it's just a killer killer machine yeah yeah i was i was impressed at how you know i, I will say this when when you pull the back cover off you can get into the um the key components that most folks care about upgrading you know or changing out at some point down the road you want to add more ram we had two 16 gig sticks in there for 32 gigs of ram with two you know, so dim sockets left over could could expand to 64 gigs if you want or swap out the sticks. Maybe you have a pair of eight gig modules in there, only 16 gigs. So that's available to you. The Wi-Fi radio is available to you. Um, the storage is available to you. Both NVMe uh, M2 sockets are available as well as the two and a half inch drive and the battery. So if the battery gets pokey at some point, you can swap that out pretty easily too with just a, a few screws. All once you pull that, back cover off if you want to go deeper in the teardown that i did you can pull the the bottom plate that maps all the components out details where they're located even the screw types that hold that plate in and then you can yeah there it is right there that thing has a has a complete component legend on it that black casing you you pull the screws and then you get down into you know inside below that that tier now you're down to the cpu and the gpu socket area and <clears throat> you know it it takes some work there's a million screws no question about it and it's not for the novice you want to be familiar with pulling ribbon cables you know from their sockets on a, a laptop motherboard uh you know maybe here and there instead of using your screwdriver you want to get a nice you know gentle plastic spudger to, to pop something up you, know, you want to be careful about it um, because it's a it's a very intricate machine, but I will say it's very well built. It's not fragile, um, and it's well mapped out, well laid out that the you can understand it with just a little bit of you know research and attention to detail and paying attention yourself what's going on. So it's it's an impressive machine in in general. I think you know folks that are considering this, not cheap, guaranteed. I want to say our config was like I don't know forty five hundred dollars. <laughs> loaded for bear but uh yeah this is the kind of thing that paul Lilly would gush over if he was on this webcast with us paul loves get desktop replacement machines what about you chris what do you think about this 
So I'm not a desktop replacement machine guy. I like my Ultrabooks and keep them portable to the task at hand. And then when I get back home and have my desktop, I'll do my gaming. Um, but as far as this implementation, I mean, it's obviously awesome that you can change out any component you want because so often you hear, oh, I want a laptop, but I also want to be able to upgrade it. Now, yeah. dropping $4,500 into a laptop to then upgrade it down the road maybe doesn't make the most economic sense. But if you do want the portable gaming experience, if you go to a bunch of LANs or something like that, um, it's definitely going to be king of the hill there. Um, so I really like that. And then just kind of what it means for small form factor desktops in general, that you have something like that with so much power and presumably airflow is a challenge in that kind of form factor. And it seems like Dell has made that tamed pretty well. So, you know, I like desktops, but I also like smaller desktops. And so that kind of just advancement and just showing how far and efficient tech has become um, is, is very exciting. Yeah, it, 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 what's surprising about this machine is that Dell was actually conservative with their um, with their thermal profiles on it. So this machine, you know, out of the box, fully loaded when gaming, is quieter than the average killer, you know, desktop replacement gaming notebook from ASUS and MSI. And we've we've actually done some comparative testing to look at that. And when you talk about, you know, uh, a six core, you know, <clears throat> standard mobile processor, uh, eighth gen mobile processor from Intel and the GeForce uh, RTX 2080 config laptop. These are big guys with, again, dual power supplies um, versus this machine versus the Alienware machine. It's actually quieter. So and, you know, by a few dB, it's not insignificant. So that's just out of the box. Then you can enable different uh, fan profiles in uh, Alienware's uh, command center uh, in that software and, and make it even, you know, cooler and overclock and all kinds of crazy stuff, which, you know, I, it seems nuts to me to, to do that in a notebook, but people do it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it's, um, it's an impressive machine. I think, you know, it's sort of, sets the bar for desktop replacements. I think I think um, you don't necessarily have to have uh, you don't necessarily have to have des you know desktop class CPUs and GPUs in a notebook. But Dell showed everybody that hey, this this thing can be efficient and well designed and sexy and actually a little bit sleek and have some serious firepower. So, um, yeah. Good stuff. Marco, anything to add before we move on? <laughs> no, man, I think you covered it. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's it's good stuff. I mean, honestly, you know, it's not for everybody. That This is a, an expensive machine, no question about it. Again, our config, I want to say it was like $4,500. Um, and it's it's a gaming, it's a desktop replacement gaming laptop. You you need to be, you know, signed up for that. And that's, that's your kind of thing. Um, but if you think about it, it's actually kind of got everything a desktop has you know maybe with the exception of you know that question mark of upgradability beyond the platform um intel platform that it's it's based on currently uh and or gpu platform from nvidia but you've got access to you know ram and drives and all that good stuff as well very easily so it really kind of you know, it, it strikes a nice balance. It's uh, it's it's got some good stuff with a little bit of portability, kind of sorta. So yeah, let's uh, let's let's move on and uh, talk about uh, Intel's launch with the new ninth generation mobile CPUs, punctuated by eight core chips, Wi-Fi six, and a desktop refresh, um, which, by the way, will spawn new laptops to compete with the Alienware Area 51M. Marco, you uh, you wrote this one up. Why don't you tell us about Intel's new refresh of, of uh, ninth gen chips for the for the mobile space? Yeah, man, wow, huge, huge refresh. Um, monstrous lineup of new chips. The only new flagship is in the mobile space. So th there are new ninth gen uh, Intel core processors coming to mobile. These are not 
true next gen 10 nanometer chips they're still 14 nanometer based on existing architectures but we have a new flagship the core i9 9980 hk is the new top end eight core 16 thread unlocked processor there's also an i9 9980h uh, also eight core 16 threads but threads but that one's locked that one is not unlocked for easy overclocking um, but there's a full lineup too. There's some new Core i7s, new Core i5. Uh, the i7 is a six core 12 thread. The i5 is a quad core eight thread, but all of these new chips uh, only 45 watts. So it's not simply the desktop chip that they're cramming in a notebook. Um, they're, they're tweaked and tuned, uh, you know, and have brought the power down to a 45 watt TDP on the high end chip. Um, but in addition to that, whole bunch of stuff, whole bunch of other stuff. So you mentioned <laughs> the new Wi-Fi 6 uh, network controller. Not a ton of detail, but we've heard of, you know, Wi-Fi 6, uh, 802.11ax um, controller native to Intel coming. Um, it's the Wi-Fi 6 AX200 uh, greater than gigabit speeds over Wi-Fi. If you have a compatible access point that also supports 802.11ax, uh, they uh, Intel launched a new higher capacity uh, 660p SSD. They officially announced well, not officially announced, officially launched the Optane H10 that we talked about earlier. But in addition to all that mobile stuff, a whole slew of other new desktop chips. So there is not a new flagship mainstream desktop chip. There's a new Core i9-9900, no K, uh, no F after that. That is an eight core chip, 16 thread that can boost to five gigahertz, but it is locked, it is not unlocked like the, hmm. uh, the 9900K, but only a 65 watt chip instead of a 95 watt chip. And that's a, you know, the conservative TDP, the, the, 90, the 9900K is not, it can do way more than 95 watts, but that's a whole different discussion. But again, a whole array of new i7s, new i5s, and then there's another whole new family of T SKUs that are even lower power. So there's a, uh, I can't read my little thumbnail here, but 9900T, eight core 16 thread chip only 35 watts but that one only turbos to a 4.4 gigahertz but again all the way down to new core i3s in that family plus new pentium golds and celerons so just <clears throat> a ton of new chips you really got to come by the site and look at the list i it, i can feel the entire podcast reading model numbers here <laughs> <laughs> hey so that just it, something just occurred to me when you just read the specs eight mm -hmm. core Eight core at 4.4 gigahertz is pulling 35 watts. So 9900T, right? Yeah. Base clock is only 2.1. Boot single yeah. core boost is 4.4. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rated for 35 watts. So I mean that's a really much. You're talking a, you know, 1.5 gigahertz lower than the standard desktop part on the base base clock you know, and 600 megahertz lower on the single core boost. So they can really ratchet down uh, voltages to get the frequencies at, at, at that level. So that's the base. Power again? Two two only two the base? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's still, it's, it's, it's interesting. We, we've, we've now got eight core laptop chips in a 35 watt envelope. I mean, you know, when you think that's about- That's a desktop chip. That's a desktop chip. So okay. for like all in ones, yeah. Okay. All right. I, I was thinking, okay, what, what's, what's the, uh, I was thinking the laptop chips. The yeah, laptop's only 45 watts though. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, still that's like, yeah. So, all right. So how did they achieve this? Did they, obviously we don't have 10 nanometer process at this point, right? We're, we're, we're dealing with current process technology, optimizations and tweaks. Uh, is that, is that really what this is all about? A couple things. Uh, yes. So, uh, you know, as Intel's 14 nanometer process matur matures and they, you know, turn the dials and sort of tweak the manufacturing process, they can extract more performance at lower voltages and, you know, ultimately improve efficiency. But the 9980HK uh, base clock is only 2.4 versus 3.6 on a desktop chip. And that single core turbo does go to five gigahertz, but they have tweaked. Um, there's something Intel is calling uh, Intel thermal velocity boost on these chips. Yeah. It will basically boost uh, as long as the thermal headroom is there. It's not just like a power limit or arbitrary limit. You, you need to have that thermal headroom. So you have that lower, lower voltages, lower base frequency, different boost algorithm, more mature manufacturing process. 
and then bang, that's how you get to those lower TDPs. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's impressive stuff. And I think Intel's really sort of bringing out, you know, you, you might not get this kind of breadth and depth of product, perhaps if, in, if AMD wasn't giving them chase like they are right now. And um, Intel's really like pouring it on. I mean, they're, they're qualifying more SKUs and more configurations of their products um, every day. And so, yeah, it's impressive to see. Keeps guys like us busy. Chris, you uh, you Jones in for any of this stuff, or um, if I good? took a shot every time Intel <laughs> released a fourteen nanometer chip, uh, <laughs> uh, but seriously, yeah. like you know, it, yeah, it's still a fourteen nanometer chip. But as Marco said, there's there's improvements coming every inner generation, um, so they are getting better. It's not like they're stuck at a plateau. You know, we're seeing efficiency gains they're cutting out bottlenecks so you know the feature size may not be getting significantly smaller down into the 10 or 7 nanometer range um but obviously they're still king of the hill at the moment you know amd is right on their heels but especially on the mobile side intel's got it on lock at this point still so you know yeah as I say it's only, it's only going to get better so yeah, there, well, there's, a, there's a sleeper chip in here that I got to make sure I talk about before we run out of time. Okay, <laughs> go. So hidden in this plethora of, uh, of chips that launched is a Core i3-9350K quad-core chip boost up to 4.6, but a 91-watt TDP, and it's unlocked. So, And it's only 173 bucks. So wow, I would bet the farm that chip overclocks easily over five gigahertz. Um, so that could be a really cool gamer. So there's no hyper threading. So quad cores, quad thread, but for for gamers, 173 bucks, probably easily overclocked to five gigahertz. That would be a fun chip to play with. There you go. You heard it here first. Marco's giving you the uh, bank for your buck recommendation. <laughs> good stuff good stuff yeah check it out um we've got uh, plenty of that i dropped by the way a bunch of a bunch of links into the comment section below it is our entire rundown for tonight and you can check that out right now if you'd like and and see marco's article on the ninth gen uh update from intel let's move on let's let's talk about uh, what amd has waiting in the wings and what is probably uh, given some, given Intel some sleepless nights, and that is the uh, AMD Ryzen 3000 Zen 2 CPUs expected for Computex keynote. We know that AMD CEO Lisa Su, Dr. Lisa Su, will be keynoting uh, Computex, uh, and there is a key performance lift. Now, I will tee this up, and I wanted to get what you guys are thinking about this thing and and what this means, because I think if this is true of Zen 2, from what I'm hearing from qualified sources in the OEM you know space the ecosystem space folks that have firsthand experience with the silicon because we're getting close now Computex is is June uh, not not too far away um, <clears throat> what this means on the desktop and I also think in the mobile space is that um, you know again Intel's got some some stiffer competition uh, and I think w w the, the the key performance lift uh, that we're talking about I think th this means that you know we really see a very strong value proposition from AMD with this with this round of product and um, it may even s be so much so that it changes the dynamic from a price standpoint from AMD and it'll be interesting to see how they react but and you know, if we could hit the drum roll, we would, but I am hearing and we've heard from multiple sources that AMD's Zen 2, Ryzen 3000 processors now, second generation Zen, is going to uh, actually bring an IPC lift on a single thread level that is on par with Intel. Now, when you think about eight core chips in the Ryzen family, you know, and so on, four core, eight, quad core, eight core, 16 core, whatever platform you talk about, whether it's Threadripper on down, to to have an IPC parity level with Intel um, uh, processors is huge um, because that was the one sort of wrinkle that, that folks said, yeah, sure, multi-threaded AMD's great stuff, um, great value certainly as well, um, you know, performance per watt uh, and dollar 
is strong with with Ryzen processors. But there was always that little, ah, but you know, Intel's kind of got them on on single thread, you know, IPC, and you know, just that that you know raw performance metric, if you will, at that single you know core to core performance that we are hearing is going away. Factor fiction will, will remains to be seen. This is technically rumor. Nothing's been announced. There's certainly no numbers. There's been some leaks around the web. We'll have to see how it all pans out. But we're hearing that um, AMD uh, 570 platform motherboards are, are, are going to bring some serious technology as well. Things like PCI Express 4 coupled with this processor advancement could be kind of cool and it could be so strong it should be such such a strong product that amd may you know it may be interesting to see how amd prices this thing they may not be the need to be the price um you know leader or as much um which would kind of bum everybody out i'm sure to hear that but it depends on the performance marco what are your thoughts on that and uh, am i all wet here or, or am i <laughs> what do you think <laughs> Um, I, th I think those rumors are optimistic. <laughs> I don't think they're <laughs> going to have a, I don't think they're going to be at IPC parity. I think they're going to close the gap, um, but I, I don't think they're going to actually catch Intel, but it's going to be such a minimal difference that it's almost pointless to talk about. Um, and then with the new architecture, with the, the separate IO die, and I, I want to see how this all plays out because that's going to add latency for some of the parts, yep. not all. So there's a lot to digest. Now, in terms of the chipset, um, the PCI Express lanes are coming off of the CPU, at least uh, the majority of them. Um, yeah. So I think the chipset's just got some electrical tweaks to, to, to make sure that the signaling is clean and can maintain those PCIe 4 speeds. Yeah, right. I think it's going to be a really nice platform. Obviously, a generational improvement over current gen. Uh, I want to be as optimistic as as the rumors. I'm just I'm not 100 percent there. Yeah, well, what I can tell you, and I I won't get into specifics, but what I can tell you is I heard I literally heard ecosystem partners excited and um, talking about having a big push for this platform when it comes out because they were genuinely excited. And when I say push, marketing push. Um, so they were they were getting spooled up and you know uh, revved up to 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 sell it. Um, so when you get that kind of excitement from them, you know you sort of yeah, like you say, you're right. You take it with a grain of salt. You sort of you digest it and you you believe it when you see it. But these are the folks that you know they have both camps at their disposal, and they mm -hmm. sell what sells. Um, genuine genuine excitement from you know, fairly high level marketing folks that are saying, wait, do you see this? You're going to be impressed. So, eh, well, we'll I see. could totally <laughs> see the OEMs being psyched, right? So even yeah. if the IPC parity doesn't match it, if it closes the gap, that's a big win. It, uh, AMD has had with this generation better multi-core scaling. Um, if that remains true, which it probably will, that's another win. Now, the other plus is that I'm going to, I'm guessing, but I'm going to assume the X570 chipset is pin compatible with X470, what have you. So really we'll mm -hmm. be on like the third generation of motherboards. So all the motherboard guys are going to have some really awesome designs, I would think, with X570. Yeah, and then you have the price, com the price competitiveness that AMD is known for. Plus, plus, right? Seven, these seven, seven nanometer chips are probably going to be at that performance level at lower power than Intel, which is also good news. So there's lots of goodness, that potential goodness. Um, and I could totally see why people are going to want to sell it for sure. I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I, I would bet the farm that AMD's partners really push these things like crazy. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to see. Chris, Chris, what are your thoughts? Are we uh, are we going to be uh, jazzed for Team Red come, come June time frame? I mean, they've been <laughs> closing the gap bit by bit over the last couple of years since Ryzen launched. So I see no reason for that to to be changing. If they're going to match, you know, IPC single threaded performance or not, obviously we're going to have to see. And then, of course, what Intel can immediately bounce back with um, because you can't count out their R&D and resources. So... 
it'll it'll be an interesting fight. I mean, obviously, we want to see more performance from AMD. So, yeah. Yes, we shall see. We shall see. Well, I, we got to wrap soon, but John, I don't know if you can uh, spare us a couple more minutes uh, to talk about um, Apple's sinister plan to squeeze Qualcomm IP royalties. <laughs> John, I don't know if that works. Okay, two minutes. I got to be. I, John, John tells me two minutes. I got to be turbo. Well, fire this one up, John. It's 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 interesting one. Um, and uh, yeah, Apple's sinister plan to squeeze Qualcomm IP royalty payments was hatched years ago. And I don't know how much we can get into this right now within this short period of time, but it's an interesting article that you should check it out. Um, and it will help you, it'll at least give you something to, to chew on and think about with respect to this uh, Qualcomm and Apple um, lawsuit that was just settled in court. Word was that Apple agreed to pay Qualcomm royalties, a, a certain fee, and then there was a, a multi-year agreement for Qual for Apple to um, utilize Qualcomm technology in future generation products. <clears throat> and really, what you know, sort of the gist of this article is that for years Apple had been sort of uh, planning to come come in and and squeeze Qualcomm on royalty payments for their for their chipset technologies that they've been using in iPhones for a long time. Apple's stance was that, you know, they've their license fees were exorbitant and that they were holding, you know, ecosystem partners hostage to to utilize their technology by charging these exorbitant fees <clears throat> and and really you know, made a, a a hard you know effort to to shift gears, whether it be with Intel or other players, to to supplant Qualcomm in their next generation iPhones. Um, and this you know was a fairly intricate, contrived plan, supposedly, allegedly, over a matter of years, where they actually even licensed IP from other manufacturers that showed how much less expensive it was to license the technology elsewhere but it still wasn't Qualcomm and there was documents leaked that said or I shouldn't say leaked that were actually posted in the in the courtroom um you know uh record record you know public record that said you know Apple executives were basically you know it's not as good as Qualcomm it's still not Qualcomm's technology and they've had a lock on you know really cellular technology from for generations now, three and four G, and now five G, they've they've got they're holding all the cards again, because they are just an absolute IP juggernaut when it comes to mobile uh, cellular technologies. It's it's a fascinating thing to to read into. I, I suggest checking out that article, Marco. Any quick thoughts before we we close out here? I just I wanted to tease it because it's such a it's an interesting, fascinating thing. I think Apple found that they. Uh, they couldn't fight City Hall on this one and uh, had to kind of roll over and, <laughs> you know, admit defeat, basically. Well, you know, this this scuttlebutt that no one will talk publicly is that working with Apple is brutal um, and because they know they wield so much power. They've crushed some little companies and, you know, basically replicated their tech on their own. And they're just extremely difficult to to work with at that level. So, you know, I like that Qualcomm fought back really, really hard and. You know, we saw what happened the last couple of weeks. So, I think yeah. you, I think you cover. Let people read the article. Come read the article and make up your mind for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's fascinating stuff. We 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 should have gave gave it more time to chat about on the on the episode here, but um, it's fascinating stuff. And and you're right, you hit the nail on the head. I think um, I think you know, the, Apple learned that they bit off a little bit too much with this one. And uh, you know, he who holds holds the patents wins. That's why they have the U.S. patent system because it protects your your ip that you invented so that's kind of huge and uh, you can't just rip it off or copy it or you know ask for your your price du jour <laughs> if uh, if it's somebody else's ip right chris right mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right and with that uh, gem of wisdom we'll we'll call it a day and let john escape um, make sure you stop by hothardware.com where you can find all of this on the web. That's where you can find us, facebook.com slash hothardware, twitter.com slash hothardware, and youtube.com slash hothardware vids or hothardware. Thumbs up and subscribe. 
because we want to have you with us when we do go live here. You'll get notified. Hit the reminder bell, of course. And uh, anything else before we say goodbye, guys? Any no, man. Of I think we did a good job. Right. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> good night. Thanks for stopping by. <sighs> Two minutes, five minutes.